So today, we'll, we're here to discuss uh, Fatui best practices. Uh, as far as people in the room, uh, can I see how many people are game developers, like designing a game, developing a game right now? So pretty much most of you. And uh, has any, everyone launched a game before, or are we all? OK. Again, pretty much most of you. OK, that's good to know. So uh, Adrian Crook and Associates has been around since um, early or 2008. I started the industry in 1995. Uh, we've worked with, oh, geez, over 100 clients now, I guess. Uh, that gives you an idea of uh, who we've worked with. Um, I would say about 25% of our clients are bigger companies you've heard of, uh, the Legos and uh, Pokemons of the world. Um, you know, who else? Jeez. Uh, uh, Adult Swim. Robio, Le uh, Capcom, Adult Swim, those sort of people. Typically what we're doing for them are uh, product management and game design sort of consultation, uh, either on games that are already in the market and aren't doing very well, and we're sort of tasked with coming in, and Peter, our, one of our senior associates, uh, is tasked with coming in and figuring out why it's not doing very well, helping turn it around, or we're doing um, game design from scratch on products that haven't reached market yet, so uh, helping them avoid those mistakes of, of launching a product that isn't doing well in soft launch or in hard launch. Um, so yeah, our job is essentially design and product management for mobile freemium games. We do design audits, we do design leadership. Those are probably our two most common engagements. And in that time, we see a lot of, uh, uh, we see a lot of Fatui's. We see a lot of, uh, obviously the biggest part of our job is uh, monetization, uh, engagement, hooking users uh, so that you know, they're, they're inclined to come back and spend. Um, and in you know, mobile freemium, that's a, that's a very hard thing to do because uh, you know, players don't have any investment in your game to begin with. So it's not as if they've spent 60 bucks uh, you know, and, they, and they're gonna make, you know, stick it out and make it worth their money. Um, I came from you know, pre-2006, I guess I came from the console game industry where you know, that 60 bucks ensured that somebody would at least sit down and give you the time of day probably 10 hours of gameplay or so. That's not the case anymore, so Fatui's are ever more yeah. important. What do you got coming up here? Sure, um, so kind of the agenda of the presentation is that first we're gonna kind of like outline what a good Fatui framework when you're thinking about um, your first time user experience, what, what does that look like? And then how has it evolved over the years? Because as Adrian said, you know, free to play is not really a new concept now. Um, but what we used to think isn't necessarily the same as what is the modern best practice. Then we go, we're going to go through some examples of that, um, and then at the end, kind of like give out. Hopefully, you can walk away with a like a checklist for your first time user experience. Did you check all the boxes off? And then um, kind of understand how the it's all evolved over the years. Um, so you can go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, for anyone not familiar, uh, Fatui, or first-time user experience, is also called the new user experience. Um, it's you know, the very first thing you know, a, a player does when they come into your app. It usually can span uh, you know, multiple sessions, depending on how you define it. Uh, the goal of Fatui's can be uh, really immediate, get someone to come back in, you know, after day one or longer term, and that's, uh, that's the kind of stuff we'll cover here. Um, and as I mentioned, in a mobile game, you have a high rate of churn initially, so you know, your day one retention can range from 30 to 50%. Uh, so you know, often half or more of your users are churning out of the game after day one. So if you can enlarge the, you know, the, the top end of that funnel, you're gonna do a lot better than focusing on the uh, individual conversion rates or, or you know, day seven or day 30 retention. So the idea of a Fatui is to enlarge that initial uh, part of the funnel, the widest part. And, uh, and yeah. Um, so, it might be a little bit hard to see with the blue on blue, but basically when you're evaluating um, a new, you're, you're kind of like when a new user comes into your game, they're subconsciously evaluating kind of this framework. Um, they're answering these questions. So like, they're asking, in the, what am I doing in this game? What is the core loop? Um, and what, when I do the core loop, what does that let, what does that like let me accomplish? Um, through progression and then the medium turn goals. Um, and then you also, they're also kind of trying to figure out what, what's the point of all this? What, what am I aspiring to do? What's the long-term vision for me to invest myself into this game? Um, so giving an example of this is uh, Kim Kardashian, uh, Hollywood, takes a good kind of framework here. Uh, so in this game, they're 
the core loop is using energy to perform game actions, basically going around. You have a certain number of actions that you can do to kind of complete a quest or a story. Uh, when you complete the quest, you level up, um, which lets them unlock new loca locations with the ultimate aspiration of being an A-list celebrity. In the Kim Kardashian game, you start off as, a, as an E-list celebrity, which is, you know, I guess you're on the board, um, but then ultimately you're going to want to get to become an A-list, and there's that com competitive nature there in this game. And that core loop you might have also heard refer referred to as a compulsion loop. And I mean, I don't know how many people in here the map as part of their sort of uh, early game design efforts map out compulsion loops for their product, but I assume it's you know, a fairly common thing, and it's certainly something we do often for clients. So mapping out that core loop or that compulsion loop is what's going to uh, inform your Fatui uh, framework design. So then uh, thinking about like where we are in 2017, where we were, you know, when free-to-play games just started coming out, um, what's, what's changed? Um, and so Fatui design is sort of adapted a little bit uh, to, to like fit the, the changes in the, in the market. So one thing that's been like, really important to note is that user quality is a lot higher than it was back in 2010, um, with both because user acquisition targeting has gotten um, incredibly strong, so that uh, users that come in are kind of primed and ready to explore around with the product and not necessarily are at a high risk of turning out early. So that means that you don't necessarily have to hold their hand as much. Um, another thing is that developers are kind of pivoting their focus away from D1 retention and more of long thinking about healthy business in the long term, D30 plus. Um, and that means that it's not necessarily having to think about what is the highest completion rate in my Fatui, what is, what's going to drive my D1 retention up, but still thinking about how can I optimize my, my Fatui with respect to longer term retention cohorts. Um, and then again, lifetime values of, of players is higher. Um, so that you're, you're thinking about what can I do to drive value in terms of spend, not just um, like early retention numbers as well. So um, one example of this is that the con like when Clash of Clans, Farmville first came out, really the common idea was that Fatuis have to guide the, the user through completely on rails by you know showing an arrow, pressing the button, and not really letting them get any kind of agency. Um, like when they're when they're going through this, uh, but now it's really um, and even then, like if you're looking at some of the stuff that was documented, there's this article from Game of Sutra saying basically saying the common trend was then was like you have to hold hand hold the hands of the users or they're going to get confused and drop out. And I mean this is obviously just due to because of the mobile market um, maturing and gamers becoming more sophisticated, so there are less. Uh, sort of gameplay conventions that we need to explain to them or hold their hand through, and they're going to be more prone these days to churning out if they're on rails and, and seeing a, you know, an arrow that they've got to tap on for like five solid minutes than if they were given a bit more freedom. Assuming is that correct? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So like you know the free-to-play mechanics have been around out in the market for a long time. That means that people don't necessarily need to be shown how to plot a plant anymore. Um, so it's it's you can get a little bit you can expand beyond that. Uh, and now, and now the common trend is to is to get the get the users in right away to the, what's the fun part of the game. Um, so if you look at Clash Royale, very first thing that the user does is they get thrown into a match with an opponent, a real well, a bot opponent, but they don't really know that right there. And then they get to kind of experience what it's like to play a battle of Clash Royale without going necessarily through what the core loop is immediately. You know, there's the systems of opening chests and collecting cards and building your deck out. Um, but really what Clash Royale developers wanted to do is just show them, like, this is awesome, this is fun, and then get them hooked right away into the action. Um, kind of going off of that, it used to be that in the tutorial that you wanted to teach all of the steps that the user's going to want to do every single day of the game. So that's including in this example here with, with Cityville, that they were teaching you how to collect the XP dubers that dropped, and then how to plant, like, harvest your, I guess, homes for coins and, and kind of go through all that step multiple times. Um, and I, I don't know about you, but like in, in new games, when I play these, I kind of skip through all this. I, I, it's been, you know, I don't really need to be taught this, and, I, and, and users in the, on, on average don't need to be either. Um, so one way to think about it is that now it's, uh, it's important to let the users have some sort of sense of agency and let them self-explore. So bringing up your tutorial and necessarily into kind of concrete steps. So 
show them one system, let them play around with it, and then when they start to engage with another system in your game, then kind of show another mini tutorial in that stage as well. Yeah, I mean, you're really just sort of planning out major beats for them to go between rather than scripting out a whole experience. Is that fair to say? Right, exactly. And then you can, and then you can really re limit the number of steps that are in your for 2E at the beginning because if you don't need to, if you're going to show some like later game uh, features and help them go through that on Rails as well, don't, let, don't need to show that until they get to that point. Um, so then a couple of examples of this, um, which like in mid-core games of Blizzard, uh, You'll see that in Heroes of the Storm, the user can't even play ranked mode until they've unlocked or played with a number of heroes, another way of educating the users. Um, and another example also is Hearthstone, um, where they, if a user has been kind of like lapsed from the game for 30 days or more, they show them a kind of a mini tutorial as well, which kind of goes that, shows that there's always something um, to think about the user and their education of the game as a sort of like a life cycle thing. So users that have been out of the game for such a long period of time might be considered um, new players or kind of think of them as like a, a, a new set of players as well and reteach them some of the main mechanics. So you're essentially putting together a custom tutorial for lapsed players? Right, yeah, and I think that's one of the, like, the best practices that's being implemented by some of the major developers. Um, Another thing was that uh, back in 2010, um, you know, iPhone was just coming out. There was Facebook platform was kind of um, running wild with notifications. It used to, you used to take it for granted that like users are going to A, be able to send notifications on Facebook and then uh, B, send push notifications, local notifications on the device um, and that they would accept the prompt for the permissions. Um, in this day and age, you have to be a lot more careful and you have to ask explicitly for permissions to send push notifications, for example, on iOS. So pretty much every developer, gaming and non-gaming, has to really think about that in the, in the first time user experience. And you can see from uh, this, this game on the right is uh, the Wheel of Fortune game. And they're basically, um, the pre-prompting, the, what they're doing is pre-prompting the user saying, hey, we're about to show you uh, the, the system prompt for notifications, please accept this so that we can message you. Um, but they're also offering um, premium currency for doing so, which may or may not uh, break the terms of surface of Apple, but it just goes to show you that it's, uh, it's super important to kind of demonstrate to the user what the value of taking notifications are. Yeah, I mean, this is another thing where users have just become more jaded <laughs> yeah. and mature over time. And once somebody turns off notifications, they're never turning them back on. So you really got to be careful you don't lose them. So popping that notification prompt right away is not, not best practice anymore where it might have been right. you know, five years ago. You can only ask one time. So if they say no, then it's, it's kind of game over. Um, another thing to think about, and I, I mentioned this earlier, is that um, you know, right when you know, the free-to-play games were coming out, everyone was really fo hyper-focused about um, optimizing their, 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 their for 2E funnel, so like where the drop-ups are in, uh, in your, in your first-time user experience, which is still important to do, but they were optimizing for what, what's going to drive the most players that installed today to come back tomorrow. But really, um, a healthy game, the D1 retention is not necessarily the highest predictor of whether your game is going to be a, uh, a profitable business. You really want to be optimizing for a longer term time horizon than that. Um, and then you can also, and then and today, is that there's a lot of ways to optimize your Fatui funnels before even having to go live, even in soft launch. So you can use um, a lot of these services that uh, provide like heat maps and uh, design kind of like feedback while you're iterating in your production cycle so that when you hit soft launch, you can hit the ground running and not necessarily have to spend a lot of time optimizing your funnels in soft launch. Yeah, like usertesting.com, that was something at one point at years ago, I was a senior product manager on Scrabble and we used that in the early days at EA to, to essentially test things without pushing it live to a large audience when we were launching a new version of Scrabble. So, you know, they're, they're good, quick, and I think it was like 70 bucks a yeah. user session or something, very affordable for even smaller developers. Yeah, definitely. Depending on what you want to accomplish, it can be a really affordable way to, to fit into your design. Um, and then so, that's kind of like a, a, little, a little bit of a breakdown of what the, the Fatui thinking has been over the years. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of just go through a checklist that you can use um, for your game and make sure that you're checking up all the boxes uh, when you design your Fatui. So um, do you highlight the fun in the first, early in the first session? So you've seen like in Clash Royale and the new Final Fantasy games, um, they are showing like the fun right away to the user and got to hook them in, which will let them kind of like 
then they're going to want to find out the, the systems that kind of support that fun a aspect. Um, do you showcase how the players can progress and what the rewards are doing are, are for doing so? So, okay, so now that I'm playing the core loop, this fun element of the game, um, what it, why am I doing this? What's, what's the reward that's completing the compulsion loop? And would you say it's important to highlight the, the, the periods uh, at which they can achieve those rewards? So like the, you know, the, the early game and the mid game and the elder game sort of rewards in that uh, Fatui, sometime during the Fatui? Yeah, I think the, the, me the messaging of like milestones and, and where the user can be and like where they're, um, and then to the next point, like what the main aspiration or ultimate goal is, like they can kind of see that and they can see, see how they're gonna be able to progress to get to that point, and that should be highlighted in the Fatui for sure. I think that in the first session, the, the user should be able to answer the question of like, what is the main point of this game, and like, why do I care? Um, and then, uh, does, does the user clearly know what the value of spending money is in the game? Um, that it used to mean that you would just show them how to spend premium currency and like, see that it skips time, but that's uh, not necessarily as, as enticing, and like every single mobile game that someone will download has premium currency that will kind of speed up timers. So they need to know really more ta like tang tangibly what that money means. So in Clash Clans, you know, that extra builder, it's very obvious what that purchase does and how it speeds up your progression in, in getting you closer to that ultimate goal. So it should, be, um, it should be clear exactly what, if I spend $5 in this game, like I'm gonna get something really fun and exciting. It's gonna make my experience a lot better. In your opinion, in the first user session, is it important to have a user spend their own money or be spending the money, the soft currency that you're giving right. them? Yeah, like, exactly. What? And so not necessarily want the user to convert and spend US dollars or whatever in the game on the first session, but um, you, so that's why like giving them enough for them to kind of experience that as like an initial endowment of premium currency or whatever will let them um, see that they can, they can do some of the game actions that require premium currency without having to spend the money, and then once they get that loop in there, then they might maybe purchase in the future. Um, and then, do you set an appointment mechanic at the end of the Fatui? Um, so that's definitely important. So, like an explicit reward timer or something. Like there's gonna, there's gonna, if there's a notification to be sent, it'll like kind of remind them that there's a reward waiting for them in the app, or just like a time for them to come back and play again. Because uh, if, there, if there's no appointment mechanic, there's no, that, there's that, that's an important part of the compulsion loop, is the actual kind of uh, timer or some reason to come back into the game. Like, again, from a timing perspective, does it matter if that's hours or days or day, or like, does it depend on the genre, how, yeah. how long you'd have? What's your take on it? I think, you know, it's definitely something that you're gonna want, like, it's, it's gotta be long enough for them to like put the, phone down and do something else and then come back later. So maybe like 30 seconds is not right. But it's one of those things that depends on the genre of the game. And then also A-B testing that never hurts as well. Um, and then at the end, kind of talking about, like we said, like think of your Fatui as really just like one, the first part of a multi-educational experience um, that there's, like, are there additional features and systems for the user to explore? So basically, if you show them everything in the first week, of, the, of playing, they're gonna play everything and then they're gonna be churning out early because there's not really anything new after the first week. So think about um, the way you teach the users how to play the game as like uh, a, a month long thing rather than just a first section. Um, here's an example that a recent game. So Clash, Golf Clash, um, what they do when you first get into the game is that they kind of like, you start playing a hole without, right away you just jump in. Um, they show you once you complete it, you unlock a new club which is, like uh, a golf club, so you said, I, I played a match, now I get this thing. Complete, sort of shows the, the progression there. Um, the aspiration being that these, you can go on these tours and, and earn uh, more and more coins and compete against people, so they, show, they highlight the, the aspiration um, early in the Fatui. And then um, also kind of setting the appointment mechanic on that, la that last uh, screenshot is that they have these chests that in three or four hours you're going to be able to get some some sort of reward. So that's the appointment mechanic in this game. And obviously in a game like this, we all know what the core mechanic of golf is. So you get in really fast and allow them to play something and then you're sort of unraveling or unfurling the rest of the game once you've piqued their interest with actual interactivity as opposed to a, a lesson up front. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly, exactly. And then another example of this is uh, it, that does this well is uh, Wheel of Fortune, uh, the Scopely game, where it gets you right in there playing Wheel of Fortune first thing that you do. Um, shows that there's like there's room to progress that you can kind of explore these new worlds um, and that uh, and it shows you how to do it as well. So that's a 
it's a very good um, example if you're looking for inspiration. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. So uh, for asynchronous uh, base rating games, say like Clash of the Clans, uh, what would be a good time to let the players can finally like start rating like other players versus like just like in the beginning, just like let them like play through like a bit more structure, yeah. uh, better structure for beginner type of like presets. Yeah, that's a good question. So those types of games have evolved a lot also over the years, the asynchronous like words with friends style games. Um, I think it's always important for like, th there's a network effect there where um, if, the, if the player doesn't have any friends to play against, they're gonna need to have, like they're not gonna really have anything to do. So it's always important for them like in those games to have new users who aren't, even if they don't Facebook connect or connect through, authenticate through any kind of social network, that they have people that they can play against in their first session and also in any time they open the app that they can start a game and play um, without having it, needing to have any kind of social graph. But then also kind of trying to subtly show them the, like, uh, the, the Facebook authentication rates on those games is really, really high because the value proposition is clear that like, I, I want to play against my friends so I need to log into Facebook to, get, to be able to see them. So articulating that like the, val the value of the game is greater if they authenticate with Facebook is a good thing to do, but you shouldn't always have to, to rely on them having a social graph connection to be able to play at any, at, so that's, always, that's one of the important things to do for those games. I mean, like years ago, I remember doing a teardown of Jewels with Buddies, and like super old game now, I guess. And uh, I mean, that's a, you know, a, a matching game, but in their first time user experience, uh, you got essentially given two uh, they could have been real users, they might have been uh, bots, but you've got essentially two games, so you're already set up with something to come back to. And I thought that worked really well at the time. Maybe it's uh, too aggressive, but on the other hand, you don't need friends and you've already got a game to come back to. Right. Are there any uh, strategies you guys use for, uh, if you think of Fatui as onboarding, uh, working with marketing? Because to me, um, the flow to for a lot of people, especially the people you pay for, is I see a piece of marketing, I flow to the app store, and then I flow into that first time user experience. So, so it can be where all of it sort of synchronizes and you get that aspiration from the marketing material yeah. and then the Fatui really has to pay that out. Are there any strategies that you guys have been using or, or have heard of that are, that are really good to use synchronizing with marketing through, through the end of that experience? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and you see that a lot with like the Machine Zone games where there's like the Super Bowl commercial with Kate Upton and it's super fun and exciting and then you go and you download it and you play the game and it's horrible and it's not fun and like why are you doing this? Like, so it doesn't really pay out. I, 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 um, I, and no offense to Machine Zone, but um, like the, those are, um, like I guess they're clearly their goal is to like just get a huge wide funnel and then like maybe out of the million people that have downloaded it, they get 10,000 people that are gonna be high payers, so. But and for most of us, I think that you're right. Um, like the marketing and the ads have to kind of um, deliver on the promise that they're giving to the users. So that's an, that's an interesting question. I think that one thing to do is just like, you, you, you want like to spend and optimize your ad spend like to make sure that you're getting, like the users that you're getting are gonna stay. So if your ad advertisement copy is really like misleading, then you're gonna see that in like maybe in some of your campaign data analytics. So I think it's like you really wanna make sure that you're highlighting what, what they're actually gonna get, what the value proposition is, and then and kind of not try to mislead users. Otherwise you're gonna see like kind of negative ROI on your ad spend anyway. So. It's a delicate balance, but I, I, I can understand where you're coming from. I mean, like, I think for us, there's a, a game that we designed and developed for a client called Hempire. It's hempiregame.com. It's a mobile game. And we do a lot of influencer marketing on that. And uh, those um, target audiences that we're uh, looking at on, say, Instagram uh, to drive users into the game, they're highly targeted around weed um, aficionados or whatever. So I think it's most important to to sort of be targeting the right group of people, the actual messaging in the ad, as long as it's not uh, grossly misleading, or like, uh, like Peter said around the, some of the machine zone stuff where it's just this very highly rendered different experience than it is in the game, as long as they're sort of uh, not incongruous like that, I think you'll see a, a good carryover, uh, good conversion rates. Hi, 
Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was excellent. Um, so we have a debate at work about teaching using hard currency in the tutorial, like making a purchase. So half of the company thinks that you should say, here's uh, 50 gems, why don't you use it to buy whatever it is? And then half of them say, no, you should say, um, it's free, the first purchase, and don't show the currency at all because then the player feels like they're spending. And we haven't settled this. I don't know if you have maybe any insights so I can bring some peace to the, <laughs> to the debate. Yeah, that's a good question. I think, and it's one of those things that like what we would all, when, I, when I, I was at Zynga, uh, before and we would we would do a bunch of A/B testing and that was one of those things that no matter what the game was, that um, you couldn't rely on previous best practices to kind of dictate what the right thing is to do. So like there's always like you're always wanting to be testing like what the initial the amount of currency is that you should give away because you always like you want to give enough where it feels like they can complete a lot of things but not too many so that they they never have to convert or anything like that. Um, I think like. I've seen it gone both ways, the way that you've been doing it. Um, uh, personally, I think that like, it's, it's the, I see more clients and I've seen more games do it where they zero it out and say, hey, like, I'm teaching you how to play, like, this is what you would do to spend it, but it's not going to cost anything right now. I think that's probably the, like, maybe a slightly stronger way to go. Ultimately, I think this is probably not, it's, it's not going to make or break like, whether or not a user is going to convert in the future. Um, I think that it, it's probably best to just kind of conform with what you see the most, just because then the more, more users are kind of familiar with that approach as well. Like, one thing I would do, though, is I'd obfuscate the fact that it was free. So if you're going to, like, I, oh, man, I can't remember the name of the game now, though. Uh, I remember seeing this, and I thought this was super smart. Um, essentially, like, uh, you got a free spin on, uh, you know, at the end of every match. And I remember after my first two matches, I won, like, a power-up each time. And then the third match, uh, I went to spin, and I didn't win, but I was given the chance to buy that power-up. So at least psychologically, I'm not thinking that, hey, I got this thing for free two times before. Why am I paying for it now? I think I'm just really good, and I won it twice. And now I'm going to pay for it because I've got this. You know, I've got this soft currency I have. Anyways, I got to spend it. So I would try to obfuscate the fact that you are giving it away for free. You know, just so you, the user doesn't associate it as like a zero value item, basically. Thank you. That was helpful. Thank you so much, Adrian and Peter. Awesome talk. Really appreciate it.